When I was 21 years old, I moved to a town called Old Forge, which is a small little village in the Adirondacks. It's a happening little spot in the summer months, but in the winter it's a ghost town. The locals keep the town running, but it's small to say the least. I'm not much of a people person and I love quiet and desolate places. The main reason for moving there though is that I'm a painter and I love the quiet atmosphere for my work. For my hobby, I paint nature scenes from all over the area where I live, but professionally, I get commissioned to paint all sorts of things. I have had jobs as small as painting a portrait of someone's cat, to as big as painting variation covers for films in Hollywood. It's an amazing life and a dream scenario for me. Shortly after moving there, I met my husband, who got me into hiking. Nothing extreme, but enough to take in the beauty of the area. Now sidebar, if you ever have a chance to visit Old Forge, do it. It's amazing. Just be kind to the locals because they aren't the fondest of tourists. So why am I writing the story? Well, mainly because my husband told me to. I don't know how scary it may be to you, but it was surely creepy and in hindsight, it is strangely unnerving. Like I said before, he got me into hiking. Behind my house, I have a small network of trails that offer up a lot of great sights. We would often walk these trails in the morning to start our days. Old Forge is home to several lakes, and if you take one of the trails to the end, you approach a small cliff that overlooks the lake. It's beautiful. One day we took the trail as we often did, and about ten minutes in, he stopped abruptly and told me to shush. That wasn't like him at all, so I looked up in bewilderment. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was something up ahead on the trail. It's not unlikely to see wildlife like deer or even a bear, but this looked like a human lying on the ground. We didn't take any steps closer. Instead, my husband shouted, Hey, are you okay over there? Whatever was lying on the ground started to move ever so slightly. I was more confused than anything else and my husband looked tense. Again, he shouted, You know this is private property, right? That was true, but I didn't really care if people hiked or walked back there. There wasn't much crime in this town and this was in the middle of winter so I wasn't worried about people walking. Besides, my property had tons of land attached so many times people would be walking in the woods behind my house not realizing that it was private property. I think my husband was just trying to get this person to move. I suggested that maybe they were in trouble and we should get closer. He was hesitant but agreed with me. We walked slowly and it started to become more visible. It was clearly a person. I was pretty sure that it was a man and he was wearing a long black coat. He was lying on his stomach on the freezing ground and as we got closer we could clearly see him moving which made me feel better that he wasn't dead. Now standing only about five feet away, my husband tried once again to communicate with the person. Hey buddy, need me to call anyone? Finally the person moved, and it was an erratic movement. He sort of barrel rolled and jumped to his feet. He looked terrified about us when honestly it should have been us being terrified of this strange man on our trail. It was not what we expected. The man was indeed wearing a long black coat, but underneath the coat appeared to be a suit. A very nice and well-tailored suit, I may add. He was very clean cut, other than some dirt on his face from lying on the ground. He had short blonde hair, with a nice edge up, slightly parted on the top. He had these piercing blue eyes and appeared to have really nice teeth. My husband stood with his arms up in sort of a defensive position indicating that it was alright and I stood behind him. The man, still looking horrified, finally spoke. What are you guys doing here? You shouldn't be here. He sounded like he was going to cry or faint. He was clearly not right in the head or doing okay. My husband tried to calm the man down and said, Hey friend, it's okay. This is our property. We're okay and so are you. Is there anybody we can call for you? The man was inconsolable. He continued to be erratic and tense and shouted, You shouldn't be here. He looked around and then just sprinted through the trees. We both looked at each other and tried to process what had just happened. He didn't look like anybody that would be in town during these months. He wasn't dressed right and he was clearly hallucinating on something. We walked back to my house, a little tense but more just shocked at what happened. We didn't think it was totally necessary to alert the authorities. My husband is very close to one of the deputies in town so he just texted him and told him what had happened. 
That way, he could at least be aware of what was happening without going through all the paperwork for something that could have been harmless. The rest of the day progressed, and I consistently looked out the windows for anything out of the ordinary, but nothing strange ever occurred. That night at around midnight, we were lying in bed watching a movie, and the doorbell rang. That alone is a terrifying experience for anybody who's ever had someone ring the doorbell that late at night when they aren't expecting anyone out in the middle of nowhere. My husband walked into the living room and shouted to the door, Who is it? And no response. But the doorbell rang again. My husband approached the door and looked out the peephole. He said it was the man from the trail, still wearing that same outfit. My husband said he kept looking over his shoulder back into the woods almost like he was looking at someone. My husband shouted through the door, What do you want? My friend's a police officer who can help you. What do you want? The man didn't answer right away. He just stood there nervously. He kept pacing on the front steps and mumbling something under his breath. I went into the living room and was standing right next to my husband. He told me to call the deputy and I did without hesitation just in case. My husband said to the man, All right, buddy, I called the police. You just sit tight. You'll be all right. The man continued to pace around and he looked completely terrified about something. Even though my husband was trying to communicate with him, he rang the doorbell again, this time accompanied with something to say. You shouldn't be here. You need to leave before it's too late. Why won't you listen? Why won't you listen? He started to cry and we didn't know what to do. Our police friend said that he was only a few minutes away, so we didn't dare let this guy inside our house. The man screamed as if he were in physical pain and shouted, No! No! Not, not now! Not now! And then, he ran into the woods again. The cop showed up a few minutes after that, and we told him everything. He called some backup and then went into the woods looking for this guy, but wasn't able to find him. The only thing they found was his black coat, which was folded over some type of tree branch. We spent the next few days just nervous, walking on eggshells, thinking that this man would show back up, but he never did. The cops never found any answers either. There were no missing persons reports that matched this guy's description, and it would be easy to say that it was just some deranged person that wandered onto my property, but it was the appearance of this man that made the story so unnerving. Whenever I hear any sort of sound outside, I fear that it's him coming back, but it's always followed by nothing. One night, a few nights after this incident, we woke up to footprints in the snow on our front steps that led into the woods, but nothing ever again. We invested in cameras on our property and have never seen anything other than wildlife since. Does anyone have any theories as to what this man wanted or what he was doing? Or was he truly just someone that sadly had lost his mind? and was having a bad night. A few years back, me and my brother Tim inherited our parents' vacation home in the Adirondacks. The house was seldom used because as our parents got older, the harder it was for them to travel up to visit the home. Tim doesn't live very far from the property, so... He's been assigned the job of checking on everything to make sure that there aren't any major issues. We recently made the decision to list the house in the market. Tim was very much on board initially, but recently had been dragging his feet with providing the necessary signatures to move forward to the next steps. I understood and didn't push the issue because it was something our parents left to us and maybe he was having trouble letting go. But after one late night conversation, Tim said he couldn't wait to be rid of it and was sick of checking up on the property every so often. However, even after that conversation, Tim didn't show any motivation in assisting with the next steps to get the house listed and sort of began ignoring me. This isn't very surprising as Tim has always been go with the flow and I have always been more structured and regimented. After a few months of back and forth, excuses and feet dragging, I told my wife that I was going to drive up to the house to see what potential work needed to be done prior to putting the place on the market. She agreed and thought it would be good to see Tim face to face and talk about some of the issues we'd been having recently. I requested some PTO from work as I was already partially retired at the time, packed a bag and began the long slow drive up to the Adirondacks. On my way I couldn't shake this negative feeling. I don't know if it was just because I was anxious or 
if something was weighing on my mind. I'm generally an anxious person and having to talk to Tim and work through some of our issues was most likely what was weighing on my mind though. The closer I got, the more uneasy that I felt. After what seemed like an eternity, I arrived. The property looked very unkempt. The lawn, trees, and accompanying vegetation was mostly overgrown. There was also trash spread out through the area. Not like fresh trash or a ton of it, but old crushed soda bottles or candy wrappers that looked like they were ripped through by a squirrel. Like trash that was imprinted into the ground and wasn't blown away with the wind. The closer I got to the house, the worse it got. Not with the trash, but with the overall state of the house and property. The deck had a fire pit that had cans inside of it that looked like it was attempted to be burned during a previous fire. The firewood was all over and the grill was uncovered. There were also several pairs of shoes and boots on the deck, which seemed really odd. The locks were still the same, which was a welcome relief when trying to get in. As soon as I walked in, I was met with a punch to the nostrils. It smelled like a gym bag or wet socks. I moved around to try and find the lights as it had been forever since I had been to the house. Once I flipped the lights on, I saw stuff all over the place. Stuff like someone was living there. There were plastic plates and utensils, sleeping bags, blankets, pizza boxes, and all sorts of other things. I began to move carefully throughout the house watching my step with adrenaline and anxiety pumping through my body. I pulled out my phone to call Tim, but no answer. The kitchen was a freaking mess, with what I assume was spaghetti or pizza sauce all over the back of the stove and wall. I didn't find anything else on the second floor outside of, again, some blankets, pillows, sleeping bags, and clothes, which were not in the dresser but sprawled out in beds and floors. Once I confirmed that no one was actually in the house, I stepped outside and tried Tim's cell phone two more times. No answer, but within about five minutes he was calling back. As soon as I answered, I unloaded and asked why he was lying about going to check on the house all this time and that now, due to his negligence, we had squatters who were living here and destroying the place. I went up and down for about five minutes, really venting out my frustrations and how angry I was at him and how he never ever assumes any responsibility for anything. I probably said one or two things I shouldn't have in the heat of the moment. Tim didn't interrupt. He waited until I was finished and came out with a confession. Apparently, Tim was allowing people to rent the house and was charging them weekly to make some extra cash since work had been slow. The same group of people had been living there on and off for years without my knowledge. I was floored. One, I couldn't believe he did this for so long without even discussing it with me. And two, no wonder he was stalling on any potential sale. He was getting steady income week after week. I let Tim know that this was ending now and that he should contact whoever he needed to get their stuff out of the house so I could begin preparing it to be listed as soon as possible. Tim tried to go on with some excuse of needing more time, but I cut him off and told him to just do it and I hung up. I went and found a local hotel to stay at for a few days before I returned to the house and I used that time to fill my wife in and vent and do some much needed shopping for supplies and other items I would need to fix up and clean the house. Once I got back to the house, all the personal belongings were gone, but the mess remained, and I spent most of the morning and early afternoon just cleaning and making some minor repairs. By the time it was around 3 o'clock, I decided to take a break and have a bite to eat on the couch and read for a little bit. The next thing I knew, I was waking up and it was already dark out. I had fallen asleep on the couch, which in all honesty wasn't that surprising given what I had done all day and the lousy sleep I had since I had been up here. I decided I would take the garbage out then come back in and do some more work inside before I called it a night. When I went outside, I noticed that the motion light in the garage was on. It didn't seem particularly windy but went off shortly after I noticed it. While I was on my way back to the house, I saw the light flash on again. This time my head whipped around and it looked like a shadow darted quickly out of sight to the edge of the garage. I thought maybe I was seeing things or maybe it was an animal. It looked too small to be a bear. I decided to go down and check it out. There was nothing inside or outside of the garage but the small pond did seem like the water had been disturbed. It had ripples like someone skipped a rock across it. I went back to the house and put on some music and went back to cleaning and repairing some molding. 
After another few hours, I was bushed and decided to call it a night. I got into bed in one of the recently cleaned second floor rooms and started to drift to sleep. And suddenly, I heard a tapping noise on the metal roof. It sounded like rain, but I didn't think it had been raining outside. I checked and it wasn't raining and it sounded like water was hitting the roof. I sat there for a minute seeing if it would stop and it didn't. I went outside to see if I could see anything on the roof, maybe it was a tree branch or something. There was nothing on the roof, but I did notice that the ground was wet. The deck was soaked and the dirt on the deck was wet as well. I followed the trail back to the garage where the water had stopped, right outside the pond, which again had ripples. I had my cell phone out for light and began to scan it across the garage and over the pond. As I was looking in the small pond, I saw a reflection of the top of a head and two eyes. I froze for a second and then let out a groan, yell or gasp, I don't really know what it was, but I just ran back to the house as fast as I could. I called Tim in a panic to let him know what was going on, he said he was on his way. I turned off all the lights in the house so I could try and see if whoever was down there was making their way towards the house. As I hid behind the curtains, trying to look outside without being seen, I saw someone crawling up the dirt path towards the house. Yes, they were down on pretty much all fours, slowly crawling towards the house. I ran and made sure all the doors and windows were locked and when I got back, I didn't see anyone there anymore. I checked the other windows to see if I could see a trail of water or any sign of movement. Then, once I made my way back to the kitchen, out of the two small windows, I saw someone standing right in front of the window. They were absolutely still. I have no idea if they could see me, so I just froze in place. And after what felt like eternity, but was probably only ten minutes, I heard a car pull up to the driveway, which I assumed was Tim. The figure suddenly darted out of my vision, and then I went outside to meet Tim and let him know what was going on. After all that insanity, all we could deduce was that someone was making their way from the pond to the roof and everywhere in between for the last several hours. I questioned if it was someone Tim had to kick out of the house, and he had no idea. The next morning, I made the decision to hire someone for the remaining cleanup and repairs, and I never went back to that house in the Adirondacks before we, thank God, eventually sold it. My girlfriend and I decided to go camping in the Adirondacks last year. We're fortunate enough to have considerable time off in the summer from our jobs and we usually spend that time going hiking and camping. My girlfriend is the nature expert out of the two of us. She is one of those people that can navigate the forest with minimal effort. She guides us through harsh conditions all the time and if I didn't have her to guide me I would for sure be dead by now probably. Her survival instincts and nature prowess are truly incredible to watch. And throughout our time together, we have hiked the Rocky Mountains over ten times, and we wanted to do something different this year. Her uncle lives in a small town in New York State called Lake George, which is in the large Adirondack region. He said that we could come visit him, and from there we could explore and hike many of the sites the Adirondacks had to offer. In preparation, my girlfriend did all her homework and prepared the path that we were to hike. The week finally came and we made our voyage to Lake George, New York. The town was a cute little place. The main strip was filled with shops and restaurants. Because it was summer, there were a lot of people here walking around and taking in the sights. When we got to our uncle's house, he told us that in the summer months, the area is flooded with tourists. He informed us not to worry though, because where we were going was not somewhere that tourists go. It was made for people like us that wanted to hike and camp in the woods. Her uncle drove about 15 minutes from his house to where my girlfriend had marked as our starting location, and we said goodbye and started our three-day expedition into the mountain woods. The hike started like many of our other trips. We hiked until late afternoon and set up our camp for the night. She found a great spot where we were nestled in the woods. That night, I didn't sleep very well. It sounded like there was someone outside the tent the entire night. I went out a few times to get some air, but every time I went out there, I didn't see or hear anything. I figured my anxious nature was just getting the better of me at this point. 
The next day, we started early and covered a lot of ground. We were hiking upward, and before long, we were gazing off a massive cliff that overlooked nothing but forests and mountains as far as the eye could see. We stayed close to this ridge and set up our camp for the night. Around 7 p.m., it was still light outside, and we were approached by three people. It scared us quite a bit. The guy in front was doing the talking and appeared seemingly out of thin air by saying, Hey there, friends. He talked slowly and steadily, like he was leaning on every one of his words. I jumped at the sound of his voice and the emergence of these people, not because they did anything bad, just the way they came out of nowhere and approached us like we were old friends. It was jarring to me and I was still anxious from the night before, which didn't help. After a brief awkward moment of silence, I finally answered the guy by saying in a soft, tentative voice, Hey, what's up? Can I help you with something? And they didn't answer right away. Instead, they kind of just wandered our campsite. Then he said after a moment, I like your tents. This is some good stuff. Mind if I look inside? I looked at my girlfriend who looked visibly uncomfortable then back at the stranger group and said, Hey, listen guys, I don't mean to be rude, but... We're actually headed to bed here in a minute, maybe next time. The guy started laughing and nodded as he made ridiculous facial expressions. Maybe reading that doesn't sound scary, but when you're sitting in the middle of the woods and three people just come out of nowhere and start making strange faces, you'd be terrified too. The guy finally said, still chuckling a little, Okay, brother, we'll take it easy. It was nice to see someone out here, it's been a long time. Then the three of them just turned around and headed back into the forest. That night after my girlfriend fell asleep, I lay there wide awake thinking about that weird invasion of privacy. I tried to justify it and tell myself it was alright. Maybe people in the area are just so nice that it wasn't that unlikely to have people walk up to you. Although something in my gut told me that this wasn't the case. These folks were a bit on the wild side. All three of them were wearing tie-dye shirts. The two men had massive beards and both had very long dreadlocks. The one doing the talking had his wrapped around the top of his head in a giant bun. The third member of the group was a woman. She had a massive bird tattoo on her neck that went down to her chest. She had short buzzed hair. She was the most unsettling of the group. While the two guys were laughing and acting strange, she stood there like a statue and her face didn't move a muscle. She maintained a scowl the entire time the group was standing there. But the main thing my mind kept going back to was when he said, It's been a long time. What did that mean? I would assume it was around midnight when I was awoken by that heinous laughter from earlier in the evening. I knew right away who was outside the tent. I wanted to cry but remained strong for my girlfriend who was starting to wake up as the laughter got louder. When she opened her eyes, I looked at her and motioned with my hand not to say anything. The man was now right outside the tent, whistling loudly. Then he started to speak again in the same drawn-out voice. Hello again, friends. You know, we were thinking after we left that you kind of treated us kind of rude earlier. I just wanted to see your tent, man. Why don't you come on out and we'll take a look inside? The woman in the group started to laugh uncontrollably. The first time I heard anything from her and the memory of that laughter still haunts me. I started to quietly grab my belongings and put them in my bag and my girlfriend did the same. I looked at her and mouthed the plan that she thankfully seemed to understand. When they attempted to come into the tent, we would run as fast as we could in the direction of the closest town. Of course, plans never go as follows. I figured that he would unzip the tent but I was wrong. All three of them started to dive into the walls outside the tent and jump on us from the outside, all while they were laughing. He was saying something at this point, but I couldn't understand him during all the chaos. When I finally noticed the zipper coming down, I looked at my girlfriend and we both bolted through the tent opening. My girlfriend was first and got through. As I ran, the man grabbed my bag that was around my back. I shook my bag off out of instinct and made a run for it without it. I turned back to see the man holding the bag in his hand and... He had something else in his left hand, but I wasn't sure what it was. I just kept following my girlfriend in the pitch black darkness, just hoping that she didn't know where she was going. I turned around a couple of times and I could see what looked like a cell phone light in the distance following us. 
I ran until I couldn't see the lights anymore and we were breathing and huffing and puffing and we just started to kind of walk briskly at that point. And the whole night until morning it sounded like people were on our tail but you couldn't see anyone because of the thick foliage. We were planning on hiking all morning arriving back in the early afternoon but since we left in the middle of the night and ran, we made it back early in the morning. We made our way to a local coffee shop that was in town and we told them to call the police. We also called her uncle and had him pick us up. The most horrifying part about the entire story was while we were sitting at the coffee shop waiting for the police, a car drove by and in the passenger seat was what I thought was the man from the woods who had just terrorized us. I was in awe of what I was seeing. He didn't see me and I was surprised when I saw him that I didn't even notice what type of car he was in. It was so disturbing that these folks were in the same town as us and somehow found us in the woods. They had to have followed us because there is no way that they would have just found us out in the middle of the woods like that. We gave our statements but there was never really any follow up. We never retrieved our gear in the woods either and sadly we never even seen her uncle after this event either. My girlfriend thinks she may be paranoid but part of me thinks her uncle may have had something to do with that nightmare. I still cringe thinking about what could have happened that night and I'm so lucky neither of us were seriously hurt. A friend of mine told me to write down my story and share it with you. He said it could be therapeutic for me, so here's my best effort to share the worst experience of my life. I'm also going to change the names of the people involved in the story for privacy reasons and I hope you understand. One of my best friends from college was getting married and asked me to be a groomsman. Of course, I accepted and looked forward to the opportunity to spend some time with my old friends from school. I had graduated two years prior to getting the offer to be a part of his wedding and it had been just about that long since I saw most of these guys. Not too long after, I got a call from my friend Josh, who was to be the best man. He told me all about the bachelor party, and it sounded amazing. He rented a cabin out in the Adirondacks. I know to some that may seem like a lame bachelor party, but this was ideal for us. We weren't the party type of people, and we didn't enjoy going out. Back in our senior year of college, we took a weekend trip to the Adirondacks to hike and play Dungeons and Dragons in the cabin that we rented. We all attended Syracuse University, which was only a few hours away from the Adirondacks. It was one of our favorite weekends from college. So, Josh figured that we could recreate the memory for the bachelor party, and I thought that was pretty cool. The weekend finally came, and I was thrilled. I got on a plane and flew to meet Josh at the Syracuse airport. From Syracuse, we would head to the cabin together. I was so excited to hike the beautiful trails in that area of New York, but more importantly, I was so excited to see all my old friends and play some D&D for the first time since graduation. When Josh and I were driving out to the cabin, we spent the first hour or so catching up on life. Eventually, we started to talk about the weekend, and he started to tell me everything that he had planned. It seemed like what I expected, except for one detail. Josh claimed that he had a surprise for all of us, but he couldn't tell me. He said the only hint that he could give me was that it was exciting and that he had been planning it for a long time. I just figured that he had some special D&D &D campaign or something planned, but I would soon find out that I was very wrong. We got there at around 3pm on Friday and set up the entire house. The cabin was nice, but nothing special. We all had our own rooms and that was awesome. The selling point was the view. Every room had a stunning view of the mountains in the background. Josh told me not to say anything about the surprise until Saturday, so I kept my mouth shut all day and night on Friday. We spent Friday just hanging out and playing some D&D &D and talking about our lives. And on Saturday, we all woke up early and went hiking around the area where the cabin was located. From our front door, there were miles of trails that were able to be hiked and we most assuredly took advantage. I took tons of pictures, and I was so excited to go through all the pictures that evening when we got back to the cabin. That evening, Josh made burgers on the grill, and we sat on the patio drinking beer and eating burgers. I was going through my pictures from the day, and that's when I noticed two very strange and unusual things. In one of my photos, I could swear that I could see a person in the background that didn't belong to our group. 
I didn't mention it to my friends just yet, as I was really studying the photo myself. A few photos later, I noticed that Josh was in the background, and he appeared to be talking to someone that was just out of the frame of the camera. The reason why that's a bit strange is that all my other friends could be clearly seen in the photo. My mind started to wander a bit. I started to wonder if there really was someone else in the woods with us, and if Josh knew about it. Then I remembered Josh's surprise that he still hadn't shared with the group, and I wondered if this had something to do with that. I didn't share any of this with the group because I was worried that if it did have to do with a surprise, I didn't want to ruin it. Not long after noticing the pictures, Josh decided to make an announcement. He walked to the center of the patio where we were all sitting and said, Okay, my friends, it's been a great weekend so far, but it's not over. I have one more final surprise for everybody. We spent four years playing video games in D&D and not experiencing life outside of our comfort zones. I thought, what better time to live a little than at this bachelor party? We all looked a bit confused and interested in what Josh was going to say. Martin, who was the one getting married soon, looked especially nervous. He made it clear that he didn't want any adult entertainment at this party and it seemed like some sort of weird setup for that. Remember, at this point, we were all sitting outside on the patio. Well, Josh opened up the back door to the cabin, and from the cabin emerged two very strange-looking men. Josh held up his hands in a presenting fashion and said, Allow me to introduce Albert and Teddy. These are, well, these are friends of mine, I suppose. Albert and Teddy are going to help us liven up this party a little bit. I looked around and... Everybody seemed uncomfortable. These two guys didn't look friendly. They were old, significantly older than my friends. They both stood about six feet, and they both had thick, burly gray beards. Albert was wearing a camo hat and a red flannel, and Teddy was wearing a black hood tightly stretched over his head. Martin stood up and said, Hey guys, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but uh, what is this? Without hesitation... The man who was introduced as Teddy stormed onto the patio and slapped Martin across the face. I mean, he really slapped him. Martin got hit so hard that he fell to the ground holding his cheek in agony. Teddy stood over his body with menacing eyes that were bulging out of his head, and we all stood in amazement, except for Josh, who looked almost sadistic like he enjoyed what just happened. Before we could leap into action, Albert, who was the stockier of the two, spoke up in his deep and rugged voice. Before any of you think you could do anything, you better think about what I'm about to say to all of you. Your friend called us. This ain't no home invasion, and we're not doing anything that we're not paid to do. Here are the rules. We're going to give you two minutes exactly to run and hide in the woods. If we find you, well, you lose. If we can't find you in two hours, then you win, and we'll leave. Your friend Josh will remain here and radio me if one of you returns. That is an automatic disqualification, and you don't want that to happen. Martin was still rubbing his cheek and said, Dude, I don't want any part of this. Josh, what the hell, man? While Martin was looking at Josh, Teddy struck Martin again, and this time it was much harder, and this is where I became scared for my life. Martin rolled on the ground in pain. Albert then said, Participation is mandatory, and if you decline, the consequences will be much worse than the baby slaps your friend just sustained. Does anyone else want to speak? As he said that last line, he gripped the holster on his belt. We all looked at each other in utter disbelief at what was happening. Oh, one last thing. My advice to all of you fine young men is don't let us find you. You won't like that outcome, and don't head towards the road. We got an entire group up there in case you decide you want to leave the game. On that note, your two minutes starts now. We all slowly started to move, and I helped Martin get to his feet. Teddy just stared at me while I was helping Martin. As we hesitantly made our way into the woods, Albert shouted from the porch, You know... You might want to run because I don't think you're understanding the gravity of the situation. He then revealed what he had hidden in his holster and fired a shot to the sky. 
The loud reverberation made us all jump, and that was the catalyst that got us to run as fast as we could into the woods as the sun was setting over the Adirondack area. What they didn't account for was that I ran track in college and I was extremely fast. Even to this day, I run 10 miles every day. And we ran, and I told them to hide and be safe and I was going to make a run to the road somehow. The trails on the land where the cabin was located were all well maintained and thankfully, I had brought my drone with me. The day before, I used the drone to see the entire extended area and got some amazing photos. And as a result, I knew exactly where to run to try to find my way to the road. I doubted that these two insane individuals had backup miles down the road, and if they did, I was just going to have to take that chance. Just as I expected, I found the road after quite some time of running through some densely forested land. When I got to the road, I ran in the direction of the town, which was still miles away. After only about five minutes of being on the road, I got service and I called the police and gave them all the information. They showed up quickly and I stayed on the side of the road where I was just in case I needed my phone again. When the police showed up, there was no backup guys there, which I had expected was a bluff. Josh surrendered right away and gave them all his information on Albert and Teddy, which ended up all being fake information. Because of the potential severity of the situation, the police showed up with a bunch of reinforcements. The cops intently searched the woods but never found Albert or Teddy. They did find all my friends unharmed, thankfully. Josh found these two maniacs on some shady corner of the internet and paid them to play the sadistic adult version of hide and seek. In his communications with Albert, they kept referring to it as a real-life version of the most dangerous game, which is a story written by Richard Connell. When Josh was questioned why he did this, with no remorse, he responded, I hate those guys, and I wanted them to suffer. It was hard to hear, and it was heartbreaking. Since that horrible night, I haven't seen any of my friends. I never attended Martin's wedding because I couldn't bring myself to fly back to New York. I know I was physically unharmed in this incident, but the mental anguish from that night still gives me night terrors. It's just hard to believe that people out there just enjoy hurting and causing pain to others. Have you ever liked somebody so much that you throw logic out the window? If you have, then you may have found yourself in a situation that you regretted. I found myself in one of these situations and not only did I regret it, but I also left with one of the worst memories of my life and I'm lucky to have gotten out without even more serious consequences. A couple of years ago I finally started hanging out with a girl that I've always liked. She was a bartender at a restaurant that my friends and I often visited. Her name was Carla and she was completely my type. She was covered in tattoos, red hair, and had the most beautiful piercing green eyes. For years, I would always tell my friends in an ironic way that I was in love with this girl. It became an inside joke with all of us. I never asked her out or anything along those lines, just always appeared friendly toward each other. She knew me by name because I was a regular, but that was the extent of our relationship. Eventually, we exchanged numbers, but not for the reason you may think. I am somewhat tech savvy, so she called me to fix her computer one day. This was our relationship for many years, and I would say the better part of the decade. We'd talk at the bar, talk about our interests, and maybe a few times a year I would help her with her tech stuff. Then the year 2020 came and the world shut down for the most part. I tried to take advantage of the time off to get stuff done that I was neglecting, but before long I missed human interaction, especially at the bar. I'm not sure what led me to do what I did next, but for some reason, I decided to text Carla. This is what the text message from me said. Hey, I know this is random, but how would you feel about hanging out for a little while? Nothing weird, just miss our conversations, lol. And then I ended the text with some silly emojis. She responded almost right away. She said, hey, I'd love that. Maybe we can go for a hike or something. For the first time since I was a young kid, I felt butterflies. Sure, it was a joke about how I felt about this girl, but deep down, I really did have some sort of feelings for her. If she would have said jump, I would respond with how high. We texted for a little while and then went on a short hike in our hometown, nothing too crazy. It was surreal to see Carla out of her element. 
to be with her alone and actually have conversations that aren't either tech related or bar small talk felt amazing. We hung out a bunch of times in the next few months, basically just hikes or hanging out in the woods. One night, she invited me back to her place and of course my mind wandered a bit. Nothing happened, but we stayed up all night and talked about everything. I'm sure it was some sort of unhealthy infatuation, but at the time I felt like I loved this girl and I know how that sounds, but the heart is weak sometimes. The next day she asked if I wanted to go hiking in the Adirondacks. If anybody reading this isn't familiar with the Adirondacks, it's a massive area in New York that ranges over 12,000 square miles. Tons of towns and regions make up the Adirondack area, and the idea sounded amazing, but I had some concerns. I live in New York, but the closest Adirondack town to me was about an hour and a half away. By the time we drove up there, hiked wherever she wanted and drove home, it would be extremely late. Carla, however, wasn't worried. She said that one of her good friends has a small cabin up that way, and we could stay there for the night. And this is where my heart exploded. No red flags at all. I was more intrigued at the prospect of staying overnight at a cabin with Carla. My mind was racing, wondering if she felt a certain way towards me, or if I was truly implanted in the friend zone. We made our way to the small town. I asked if we should stop at the cabin first and drop off our bags, but she told me to wait, claiming that her friend wouldn't be back until later that night. I drove and she guided me to an area that didn't appear on any of the map guides. I pulled over on the side of the road and she told me that this is where we needed to hike. She told me that this is where all the real action happens and we don't want to hike the trails that everyone else hikes. I just shrugged and just went along with her because I had no reason not to trust her. The first stretch of the hike was tough. It wasn't any type of designated trail, so the wooded area was miserable to traverse. Eventually, we made it to a cliffside, and you could see nothing but trees and mountains. It was beautiful. I was taking in the beauty of my surroundings, and when I turned around, Carla kissed me. I nearly fell off the cliff. She pulled away, smiled, and said, I'm sure you liked it. Let's keep going if you can focus. She knew she had me hooked. I didn't say anything for a few minutes other than a couple of times when I barely uttered the word, whoa, and she just giggled. After a few minutes, we started talking as normal. I couldn't get her or that first kiss out of my mind. I was tripping mentally and literally, and I kept falling over branches and roots. The sun started to get lower in the sky, and I kept asking when we were going to start heading back. We'd been walking for a long time, and my car was at the beginning of our walk. She kept saying not to worry because she knew where we were. We made our way through a thick patch of trees, and then she shouted, Surprise! Here's the cabin! This entire time she'd been guiding us to the cabin. I was thrilled, mainly because there was no other car at this cabin. I figured she and I were going to be completely alone. We got inside, and to my joy, she said, Don't worry about your car. My friend will be back in the morning she'll drive us to your car. But tonight... It's just you and I. I felt my heart racing with excitement. I was giddy as can be and even shaking a little bit. And the night started off amazing. We made a fire and cuddled up next to it. We kissed again and at this moment, in the cabin with her, in front of the fire, I was as happy as I'd ever been in my life. But unfortunately, that happiness would be brief. We were lying on the couch together in front of the fire when I noticed headlights shining through the window. She said, don't worry about that, it's probably just my friend back early. She won't bother us. I tried to ignore the lights, but they weren't shutting off. I felt so uncomfortable and this was the first time that something just didn't feel right. I started to hear a creaking noise coming from down the hall where the bedroom was. Carla kept grabbing my head, trying to keep the focus on her. I looked up again and saw that the lights were still on from the car outside. I looked over to the left, where I had heard the creaking sound and now the bedroom door was closed and I knew it was open only a minute ago. I jumped off Carla and told her that something wasn't right. She seemed annoyed but told me to check it out if it would make me feel better. I walked by the window and tried to investigate the car windows but the headlights were so bright I couldn't make out if anybody was in the car. I walked slowly down the hall until I was about two feet from the bedroom. I leaned in close to see if I could focus on my hearing. I could hear what sounded like soft footsteps coming from the other side of the door. 
and my heart started racing, but not for the reason as before. I slowly grabbed the doorknob and opened it, and I felt a wave of relief as I scanned the room. It seemed to be empty. This was a legitimate wood cabin, so it probably did make all kinds of creaks and noises. As I was about to turn and walk back to Carla, I noticed one thing. My bag from our hike was open and it looked like it had been gone through. I bent over to examine the bag and at that moment, the closet door flung open and two people ran out and smashed me in the head with what I think was some sort of stick or cane. Whatever it was, it had cut me because I felt a small amount of blood trickle from my forehead. I screamed in pain out of instinct and Carla ran in. I was terrified that Carla was in danger. I rushed to my feet as quick as I could, even though I was disoriented from the headshot. Carla wasn't scared at all. Instead of screaming, she looked at my attackers and said, Hey, beautiful. One of the attackers went over to Carla and gave her a very long, loving embrace. And this is when I noticed the two attackers. They were both smaller women, all covered in tattoos just like her. The other woman went over to Carla after the first one walked away and she also lovingly embraced Carla. I tried to ask what was happening but the pain in my head started to get worse. I fell to my knee and I heard Carla say, Is he still outside in the car? One of the girls must have nodded because then Carla followed up by saying, Okay, let's tell him and take care of this. I started to get an even worse feeling than I already had. One of the girls left the room and must have opened the front door because I heard her shout, Okay, he's down. Come in now. I looked to my side and noticed that the window was open. That was probably how the women got inside. And without thinking, I got up and jumped out the window. I heard Carla scream that he's running. And she was right. I just ran into the pitch black woods. It was a cloudy night so the moon wasn't giving off any type of light at all. My phone was still in my bag, which was in the cabin, so I didn't have any light or anybody to call, even though I didn't have service anyway. I felt dizzy, so I decided to stop running and hid where I was, figuring that they would assume that I'd be running in the direction of my car, or maybe I would just keep running. I was laying on the cold, dirt ground, just hoping that the night would end soon. At one point, I could hear footsteps. I didn't want to move and give my position away, and from where my head was lying... I could see a beam of light shining right above me, accompanied by footsteps getting louder. One of these attackers, maybe Carla, was right next to me but opted to go the other way. Thankfully they didn't see me, and that was the only close call I had for the rest of the night. I stayed in that position until dawn and saw the faint signs of light shining through the trees. I thought about heading back to the cabin but figured someone would probably be waiting there, so I started walking in the direction I ran. I'm not sure how long it was, but it felt like hours, and I was lucky enough to eventually find the road. I flagged down a car. Thank God they stopped. He saw the blood on my head and called the police right away. They showed up and I was able to tell them everything and get treated for my injuries. I told them about Carla and gave them the best descriptions I could as to what her friends looked like. I sustained some minor head injuries, but thankfully nothing serious. As of writing the story... Carla has yet to be caught and seemingly fell off the face of the earth. Nobody in my town has seen her since the bar shut down at the beginning of 2020, and I don't know who was in that car that night, and more importantly, I have no idea what they intended. Friends that are familiar with the Adirondacks told me that I'm extremely lucky that I made it to the road because I could have easily wandered in another direction and had been walking in nothing but forests until I either died or were attacked by an animal or something. I still can't believe that the police can't find this Carla, even with all the information I was able to give them. This may be the last time I listen to my heart, and more importantly, the last time I visit the Adirondacks. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I apologize in advance for the long story and I'll do my best to try and explain this horrible night the best I can. I'm from a small town in New York where not much happens. We have a big Walmart that serves as the central hub of my town. When I was in college in another state, I would tell people that I was from New York, and people often assumed New York City, but where I lived was the polar opposite of New York City. 
I was about to start my senior year of college, and after graduating from college, I planned on moving anywhere that wasn't my small town. Prior to going back to school, my friend Alicia asked if I wanted to go to an end-of-the-summer party. Of course, without hesitation, I was down. Alicia wasn't like most people in my town. She was a professional model, and she lived in Miami, Florida. Once high school was over, she left and instantly became famous. She was home for several months in the summer mainly because she could afford to do so. She kept claiming this party was going to be the party of the century. Her words, of course, not mine. I was a little confused because honestly, I didn't know how we were going to have a party like that in my small little town. When I asked Alicia about the details, she just laughed at me and said, Dude, the party isn't in this stupid town. One of my connections from down south is having a massive party at this mountain house up in the Adirondacks. There's going to be a lot of prominent people there. The idea of this party intrigued me and made me a little nervous. Alicia was beautiful, and this party was hosted by one of her colleagues in the modeling world. I assumed that there would be people at the party that were all on Alicia's level. I, on the other hand, did not stack up to Alicia. I'm short for a man, one of the shortest in my graduating class. I don't stack up to the normal objective standards for beauty in men. And for years, people have always made jokes as to why Alicia even wastes her time with me, considering how I look and how she looks, and the answer is that she's an amazing person. We've been friends since second grade, and she's family to me now. She doesn't see me as an awkward-looking man, and I respect her so much for that, but she also doesn't realize what people say to me and do to me when they see me with her. One time, we went to a bar together when I went to visit her in Miami, and some guy knocked me out because he thought I was some creep stalking her just because I don't look like I belong. I know, it's sad, but I'm used to insane stuff like that. So, all I kept thinking about when I would think about the party was, are the people there going to judge me for being there with Alicia? I wrestled with the idea for a while, but ultimately I decided to go because I'd never been to the Adirondack area before. We lived about two hours away from where the party was being held. She showed me pictures of the house on Facebook and it looked incredible. It had a huge wraparound porch in the back that overlooked a small lake. The house was way up in the mountains and surrounded by trees. The deck had a bar, tables, and a hot tub. The pictures made it look like it was big enough to fit 20 to 30 people on this back deck. The inside of the house was gigantic. It looked like it had those cathedral ceilings and windows that overlooked the lake. If I was hesitant to go before, after looking at the pictures, I was for sure down to go now. The night finally came and we made our way to the Adirondack house. The drive itself was scary enough and about an hour into the drive, we got into the mountainy area and once we got off our exit, it was pitch black and the GPS service was hit or miss. There were no lights anywhere and it was just a narrow road with houses every hundred yards. We found the street eventually, and it was just a long road of nothing but trees and dirt. We finally came across the house at the end of the road, and wow, is all I can say. The house was infinitely more beautiful than the pictures could ever show. It was massive on the inside, like something out of Lord of the Rings or something. We parked, and I was immediately intimidated. There was a ton of cars there, and the house looked like it was alive because of all the lights and music coming out of it. It was loud techno or some type of synth and lots of purple, pink, and blue neon lights dancing to the beats of the music. We approached and Alicia went right in and started dancing immediately. I never understood how she could just walk into a party or bar and just talk to anyone and act like she knows everybody. I stood there awkwardly, still in awe of this house. I made my way to the back deck and stared at the moon. I would like to tell you it was peaceful, but it was just as loud out there. People everywhere, drinking, smoking, jumping in the hot tub, dancing, you name it. I was completely lost and out of place. I found Alicia and told her that I was going to sit outside, drink my beer, and just enjoy the view. I told her to have fun and we could leave whenever she was ready, and most importantly not to worry about me. She felt bad and tried to get me to dance and stuff, but I was happy to sit outside and stare at the view. It really was an amazing view. This place was completely nestled in the mountains and secluded from everything. I ended up getting so caught up in the sights that I eventually tuned the music out and I dozed off for a little while actually. I ended up waking up and noticed that the party had calmed down a little bit. Probably 20 people just sitting around talking now and the music was at an appropriate level. I looked at my phone and 
I almost fell off the deck when I realized that I'd been asleep for four hours. It was almost three in the morning, but even more horrifying was that I had 28 missed calls from Alicia. She had texted me, but I didn't look at the text yet, and I tried to call back first and it went right to voicemail. The first text was simple. Hey Dan, I saw you taking a nap, I'm just letting you know I still need a ride, but if you wake up and I'm not here, don't worry. I went with a group of people down to the trail to get closer to the water. Don't worry, I'll see you soon. Ten minutes after that message, I received two more messages. The first one said, Dan, please answer the phone, I need help. Then even worse, the next message said, please follow the path, please. Then I received one last message from Alicia two hours after that last message that said, Hello Dan, my name is Adriana. I'm one of Alicia's friends, I just wanted to let you know that I have Alicia. She's not coming back with you, so you can head home whenever. Have a good night. The message came after all 28 missed calls in that last text from Alicia. Something fell off, and I didn't want to leave until I got a better answer. I remained calm and asked everyone on the deck if they knew Adriana, and all of them said no. I asked about a trail that leads to the water, and that's when one of the men spoke up and said, Hey, what's this about? I don't recognize you, and now you're asking all these questions about my house and these trails. And my eyes lit up. This is your house? I shouted. The man got up and stepped over to me in a defensive way and said, Yeah, it is. If you don't tell me what's going on, we're going to have a problem, all right? I took a step back and tried to explain everything to the guy, who was a giant and built like some professional wrestler. When I mentioned Alicia, he instantly perked up. Wait, you're Alicia's friend? Tell me again what happened. Once he realized what was going on, he looked tense and nervous, and I was terrified that something was wrong. We made our way down the trail that led to the water. It took about ten minutes for us two to get down. I felt sick when I saw the scene at the shoreline. It looked like some sort of struggle had taken place. The dirt was all kicked up and there were broken bottles laying around. There were flip-flops and shoes and what looked like blood, but it was dark, so I couldn't be sure. We started to shout her name, and from the woods, a skinny woman appeared. She was smiling and looked all too calm. Can I help you find gentlemen? She said with a haunting grin on her face. The man who owned the house, whose name I still don't know, said, Yeah, we're looking for a friend, Alicia. I don't want to know who made this mess down here. The woman giggled and ran back into the woods. He started after her, and as soon as he got to the tree line, I heard one of the most unnerving sounds I'd ever heard. The woman emerged from behind the tree with a metal baseball bat and struck the guy in the forehead. It sounded like a bat hitting a ball, and it made my skin crawl. The man was hurt, but was able to get to his feet. He was not right, though, as he started to wobble when he tried walking. I shined my flashlight into the woods only to get a quick glimpse of the woman running away further into the darkness. I was too scared to chase her, not knowing if there were more people hiding in the woods. Thankfully, two more guys came down right at this moment, and one of them was able to help the owner back up and call for him to get some medical attention as well as the authorities and let them know what was happening here. I don't know what came over me next, but I decided to run into those woods. I chased the woman the best I could before I lost her, and before long I was lost in the woods too. Even with the bad service, I somehow received a text from Alicia that said, I see you. I looked around, shining my light, and saw nothing. Instead of moving, I called her phone because whoever had the phone must have turned it on now. I heard it ringing, and I could see the light from the incoming call and was only about ten feet away from me. As the light from the call was blinking, the small woman ran at me with a bat. Thankfully, I was able to move out of the way and luck was on my side as well because she dropped the phone when she tried to strike me. Without thinking, I picked up the phone and ran as fast as I could out of those woods. The other man was still there waiting for me and we could hear multiple footsteps in the woods running. We ran back to the house and locked the doors, figuring that the police would be there at any moment. I looked back at some of the texts on the phone, and the conversation before mine was with a contact, all one word that was named Jace or Amy, with a question mark after the names. And the text read as follows. Please let me just go back up and get Dan. The response was, no, Dan can't come, Alicia said. Everyone will worry, please let me get him. 
and the last response from this contact was, go sit by the rock and we'll talk after. Nobody who was left at the mountain house has any idea what that meant. The cops arrived and we searched the woods with the police. When we got down to the area where the woman attacked me, we heard several footsteps escape into the woods. Several yards from that spot, I heard the sound of sticks breaking. I went to investigate and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Alicia, lying there with two other guys. All three of them were completely unconscious and wearing black sunglasses for some reason. We got them safely out of the woods and brought them to a local medical facility and before long, Alicia finally came to, having no memory of anything happening that night. She remembers walking down to the lake and seeing a skinny blonde woman and that sounded like the same woman that tried to attack me. She said that after seeing the woman, she can't remember much. She doesn't know who that contact was that she was texting, and she can't remember calling or texting me all those times. Thankfully, no harm came to Alicia or the two people we found lying in the woods. After running tests in the hospital, all three were okay other than a few scrapes and bruises, but I have no idea what happened that night, and who those people were. There were definitely more than just one woman, and she was the only one I saw, though. I still have no answers to that mysterious contact on Alicia's phone and no idea what the end game of this event was. As for Alicia and the two other men, they don't remember a thing, so they pretty much moved on with their lives, but for me, I must endure those memories and pain I felt that evening, and I have to continue to move on without knowing why this happened. The simple answer is some people are just terrible humans. Be careful at parties, especially weird ones out in the mountains. Don't trust strangers, ever. Let me first say, I hate nature. I'm sorry if saying that bothers anybody, but it's true. I hate the smell, I hate bugs, I hate getting lost. I just hate it all. I know that makes me sound like some pessimistic person, but I have my reasons. My family used to go camping every year, and I always hated it. My parents would force my sister and me to hike whenever we went on these trips. When I got older, I would stay in the car and listen to music because I wanted no part of the outdoors. When I was finally 18, I moved away from my family, far away from nature, and I spent nearly five years in Chicago until I got one dreaded phone call that I'll never forget. My dad called me and told me that my sister was missing. Again, not to sound pessimistic, but it didn't surprise me, unfortunately. You see, my sister had some issues when she got older. She got involved in things and with people that were less than ideal. I basically dismissed my dad, claiming I had more important things to worry about, and I hung up the phone. A minute later, he called back in tears, and I had never heard my father cry. He told me this time was different. Whenever my sister went off the grid in the past, they could always track her down, but this time they couldn't. He knew something was wrong, and he begged for my help since my sister was disabled and really couldn't do much. I just flew home right away, and my dad gave me all the information. The last they talked to her was in some small town in the Adirondack Mountains, and she sounded scared and nervous, almost like she was being forced to say that she was okay on the phone. Me, my dad, and my family friend who was a retired detective from the police department in our hometown made the trip to the mountainous region. Of course, why wouldn't it be in a mountain town like this, I thought to myself. After we arrived in town, we started kind of asking around, asking if people had seen my sister, showing them pictures and whatnot. And this seemed like just some futile task until some random guy claimed not only did he see her, but he knew who she was. This was the kind of guy that you wouldn't want to talk to. He was dirty and smelled like sewer water. His teeth were yellow and we could barely understand this guy. And he said in this just gruff voice, Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know her. She, uh, she's with Mike. That's Mike's girl. Why, uh, uh why? Uh, you, you need Mike's girl? Our family friend very calmly talked to the guy. He put his arm around him and they talked for a few minutes. I couldn't hear anything they were saying. I saw him give the dirty guy 20 bucks and he pointed to the distance and was explaining some type of direction. We said thank you 
and all ran to the car and drove to where this guy was describing. There was a beat up old sawmill about two miles down the road. Behind the mill was a path. There appeared to be footprints in the mud that led down the path. It was still bright out at this point and we made our way down the trail for a few minutes until we came up to a garage of some type. It had the same siding as the sawmill so I figured this was some sort of storage building at one time. The doors of the building were shackled shut and all three of us wouldn't be able to break them down. At this point I wasn't even thinking about how that dirty guy knew exactly where to go and I probably should have. I was just so focused on getting to my sister. I made my way to the rear of the building to a small window and I peeked through the window and I was disgusted and enraged at what I saw. The building was a mess on the inside and even more horrifying was I could see my sister lying there on the hard floor. I started to yell and bang on the window trying to get my sister to budge and she wouldn't. Not caring at all about this building I broke the window and climbed in. When I finally got to my sister I was briefly relieved that she was still breathing. I tried to get her attention but she was completely unconscious. Then I realized I'd never thought about a way out of the building. The window was just high enough that I wouldn't be able to get us both out without cutting myself and the door was shackled tight. My dad ran over to the window and started to bang on it. I turned and looked and he said in a frantic voice that someone was coming up the path and to hide. I put my sister down and hid behind a curtain that hung in the back of the building. The door opened and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was the dirty man from the street. He went over and picked my sister up and sat her on the couch. You, uh, uh, have some friends looking for you. Have they been here? Yeah. He stopped speaking when he noticed that the window was broken. He got up and looked intently at the broken window, and I used that as my chance. I sprang from the curtain, tackled the man. I screamed for my dad to grab my sister as I held the dirty man down, and once I saw them grab my sister, I ran out with them. As the sun was finally setting, this nightmare was also finally almost over. A few hundred feet from the sawmill, I got struck by something that knocked me off my feet. As I tried to regain my footing, I noticed that whatever he used on me severely damaged my ankle. I couldn't stand up and extreme pain started to set in. While I grimaced in pain, I was then jumped on by this deranged man. And we struggled in the dirt for a minute, but I couldn't overpower the guy. The pain I was in was too much and this guy knew it. He started to beat on my ankle and I was starting to black out. I looked up one last time to see the man go into his waistband for something and thankfully from the path came my family friend who tackled the guy again and then threw an incredibly hard punch that kept the guy down for the moment. He picked me up and carried me back to the car and then we fled to the nearest hospital for me and my sister. We reported everything to the proper people. And if you can believe it, they were able to apprehend the guy. His name was really Mike, and I don't know if he was on something, but this idiot gave his real name and exactly where he was keeping my sister. Thankfully, my sister was alright after a few days, and it's a sad reality. She had actually made a full recovery when I was living in Chicago, and this guy was angry about it. So we kidnapped her and brought her to that small town. Thankfully, he never physically did anything to her. He was putting something in her water to just basically make her a vegetable. I have no idea what his endgame was with her, but she was not in a good state when we showed up. I'm just thankful we showed up when we did, and I'm so thankful that my sister ended up being alright. And thank God that that guy was an idiot, because at least now I know that he can't hurt anyone anymore. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or send it over email, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel.
And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, yo mama brought a spoon to the Super Bowl. <laughs>